So now it's time for this week's difficult conversation. Now, today marks the 30th anniversary of the racially motivated murder of Stephen Lawrence, who was stabbed to death whilst he was waiting for a bus in Eltham in south-east London. And this morning, his family held a memorial service at St Martin in the Fields Church in Trafalgar Square in London. Dr Mark Prince knows only too well the impact of losing a loved one to knife crime. He lost his 16-year-old son, Kayan, a talented QPR player, in a knife attack outside a school in 2006, where he was trying to break up a fight. Back in 2021, FIFA used deep fake technology to bring the young footballer back to life. Now, when his father saw the imagery, he was reduced to tears. Mark has since launched the Cayenne Prince Foundation in his memory, raising awareness about knife crime and how it can tear families apart. And the most recent facts about knife crime in the UK make for alarming reading. There has been a 10% increase in knife crime in England and Wales from last year. And since last year, there have been 45,000 offences involving a knife or a sharp instrument. And since 2010 and 2011, there have been a 34% increase in offences using knives or sharp instruments. And knives and sharp instruments are used in 40% of homicides. West Midlands has the highest rate of knife crime. That's 152 offences per 100,000. And in the year 2021 to 2022, 19,500 sentences were handed down for possession of a knife. Juveniles made up 20% of those 19,500 sentences. Mark now works with children and young people using the sport of boxing to inspire and set them on the right path in life. And I'm very pleased to say that um, uh, founder of the Cayenne Prince Foundation, Dr Mark Prince, is here to join me now. Mark, thank you very much for joining me. It's really good to meet you. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, uh, but it, thank it, you. it's so tragic. I mean, we were saying earlier mm. that there's so much knife crime and it's getting worse. And I know a lot of it is by <clears throat> black youths as well. We can't get away from that fact. Um, let, you know, talk to me about Cayenne. I mean, what, what kind of boy was he? Was he somebody who would be involved in, in anything to do with weapons and knives? <laughs> you know, Cayenne's the last person. Uh, to be involved in weapons or knives. Kayan was all about a mindset of success and becoming great. He watched his dad as a successful number one light heavyweight in the country growing up. And um, I was his hero, as he shared with his mum. Uh, I was his inspiration. And um, that example you know, showed in Kyan. So whether it was already in his bloodstream and, you know, he just got into football and loved it. But what else was lovely about him was the way that he um, treated people. Mm. This was really special about Kyan. But then again, we brought Kyan up to understand that he comes from a great creator mm. that has made him. He's brought value to this earth. He's been made with purpose. He has an identity, but he must add value by the way he treats people. So his mum would instill that love, value in him. I would instill that love mm. value in him. So what would Kyan do? After he passed, I heard so many stories of kindness and care and leadership mm. qualities from Kyan, whether he was playing in a football team on Sunday with a bunch of guys and a fight would break out, or whether he was at school and somebody was bullying a year seven and he would cut in and stop that bullying and tell the guys, no, nah, don't, don't pick on him, Just don't, don't treat people like this. So you could see that he takes on how he was brought up to be as an individual. What a fabulous young man he sounds. I mean, he 100 percent must be. So, so what happened? How, how did he get involved in this? Um, Kyan was just leaving school and there was a fight. And obviously most kids fight, fight, fight. And they, they encourage it. Um, but Kyan didn't want to see people um, fighting each other. So just tried to break it up, peaceably break it up. And the guy just pulled a knife out. The guy pulled a knife out, he was a year above him. Kyan was 15 at the time, the guy was 16. And um, Kyan said to him, but put, put that away, man. What are you doing with that? Put it away. And then went to walk off and the guy came after him. Literally, the kid said he kind of just jumped on him and started the stabbing motions. Um, so Kyan, obviously, in his world, he's not expecting somebody to, to stab him. He's a popular guy. You know, he's not doing anything worthy of getting stabbed. Not that there is something you can do mm. worthy of being stabbed, but that situation didn't cause for that. But what it shows is that there were red flags because that individual 
you know, had they found out during the court case, it was brought up, I found out, that he'd, he'd urinated in front of a teacher at school. God. He'd threatened a girl on the bus to stab her, shank her on the bus for, you know, opening a window on the bus when he didn't want it open. So there were red flags. And uh, we, we have to start looking at underlying issues with, with young people. What's, you know, going on in their lives? What's happening with them? And he's come from a war-torn country. We don't know what he's seen in Somalia. So, so he was not from this country? No, yeah, he was... Um, Hanad was from... Uh, uh, um, um, gosh, how could I even... Yeah. He, um, just, just not, not so Eritrea or something like that? Or no, 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 no. Does no, it begin no. with? It's... Oh, gosh. Give me a letter. Why has it gone from... <laughs> there's, there's lots of them are coming in. There's, there's, oh, gosh, how could I forget where he's... Well, don't worry, it'll come back. It's from, yeah. Carry on. It'll come back in my head. Back to you. Yeah. So, so this kid, there was already kind of red flags for this kid. Yeah, there was. And, and the agencies that should be kind of sort of keeping an eye on safeguarding yeah. children like this yeah. and keeping an eye on them, yeah. doesn't sound like there was much going on. So when... It's oh, missed sometimes at yeah. school. Because at school, all they do is give out detentions mm. and whatnot, and it doesn't actually tackle the issue. And school doesn't look to, to look at the underlying issues. Mm. That's why there's, there's, this, there's this route from school and into Prus into prison. Mm. And, you know, it's, um, expulsions are on the high, on the rise, and then you'll find that a lot of those same kids end up going to, to, to jail. So I think I think maybe it was it he was Somalian, was it? That's correct. So, That's so, the word I was looking for. I so, don't know why it didn't. So what happened then? So people knew who he was. They knew who stabbed Kyan. My my daughter knew him. He was a friend of my daughter. This guy was a friend of your daughter. It totally messed my daughter up, Tanisa. Really messed her up. Because how do you get your head around that? First you hear your your brother's been stabbed, and then you hear it's from a guy in the age above in a in a year group above. Your brother, your friend. and you know him. Did he you know talk that, with him? That she, he would shoot. Hundred percent. So but what knew. she didn't know mm. is that there were jealous aspects about um, ha that Hannah had, had for Kyan. Because mm. in the in the in the police station, he talked like really strange comments. How can this guy be so wham, which is like well built um, at, at, for his age? How could he, you know, so how could he be good, so good at football? How could he be so good at basketball? You know, he he's younger than me, so he was jealous. And then I heard that, you know, he, there was a girl he liked and she liked Cayenne. So there was lots so there of things. There may have been some other things going on where that not, was in his mind. He's obviously not here to that talk about Cayenne's not aware himself, of. But, but so this, <clears throat> so this guy who was then, he was arrested. Is he in, yeah. he's in prison now? He's in prison now. He's he in, just had. They, they went for his first parole last year mm -hmm. and obviously they wanted a comment from me because I've actually tried to go in on a visit as well so mm -hmm. I could get to meet Very and brave talk with him. Daughter. Yeah, it's, it's been a tough process. Everything I've done has been a process of really difficult things, mm -hmm. going into schools, going into Prus, you know, going into the community, talking to young people, running... You know, these, you going into yachts, youth offending teams, talking to guys who are on the youth offending for carrying knives, for stabbing people, for, you know, ruining families. But was this an eye-opener? Going eye into prisons. Was this an eye-opener for you? Because obviously when you heard about what had happened to your son, I mean, you must have been devastated, right? Well, well imagine I'm working in the system already helping those young people. So that's what you were doing? That's what I was doing. From 2002, I trained to be a life coach. My, my career co abruptly ended in 2000 with my knee um, getting, getting ruptured. And then I went into counselling, uh, youth work, and done all what I needed to educate myself and then began to work with young people. Mm -hmm. I used to bring Kyan with me so he could Aww. see how privileged he was to have his dad when a lot of young boys didn't have a dad father figure and hadn't been given the same examples. He used to, he made great friends. Mm. We, we took him out canoeing. Oh, so cute. Yeah, it's, yeah, really, really, really awesome he guy. He must have been so devastated. Listen, what, what, uh, there's how, no way I can begin to take people on the journey yeah. that I went through and his mum went through afterwards mm. to to try and get them to understand the pain and to understand how this can happen to anyone. Mm. That's, that's what hit me, how this can happen to anyone. I used to watch 
uh, news about serious youth violence on the telly and other people, families, their children being stabbed and feeling so hurt for them, not in the not in all my worst nightmares could I imagine you're going to be one of those mm. families next, you know, Prince. Did I not think that? So I want people to understand, don't sit back and think this is one demographic problem. No. Because whatever era you go in, if they're predominantly black, it's going to be predominantly black having that issue. If it's predominantly white, it's going to be predominantly... If it's predominantly Asian, you're going to have predominantly... There's Asian gangs, there's, the, you know, Liverpool gangs, there's Birmingham. They're all over the place. But it's a, a mindset It issue. is a mindset. I agree with you. But... but you know, it's annoying for me, obviously, being a black woman, yeah. to see a lot of this perpetrated by black individuals. And I think to myself, stop. Why, yeah. why are they doing this to themselves? Stop, yeah. stop killing each other. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, people say, oh, it's terrible, but, but as somebody who's black is more likely to be killed by somebody who's black. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. When people say, oh, it's terrible, there's, there's racial this and that, it's like, well, can't you see what you're doing within your own, yeah. you know, within your own section of yeah. people who are like you, who look yeah. like you? They may not think like you, but they may look like and you. Self-hate. It's so easy for people to tag them up as black lack people. Lack of identity. It. You know, it's the same issues when you look at it. Mm. It's about the mind. We can take a knife out the hand, but we need to get it out of the mindset. So the mindsets change and people begin to look at another human life with value. Yeah, that's it. They and that's don't what it is. It's about life. respect. And I think one of the things is, is understanding that you do not have the authority to take life. Mm. You do not give life. There is a higher power than yourself. And it was healthy for us to grow up and understand that there is a God Almighty who's created all of this and created you with purpose. And taking that out of the education you know, schools... You know, I'm so glad you said that. I believe that, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not somebody who's deeply, deeply religious. I was at one point. But mm -hmm. when they took religious education out of the curriculum, like a general standard of moral code that everyone kind of followed, there, there became a shift yeah. in the narrative. Yeah. And I'm not saying that people 100%. should be all God-bothery and things like but that. But we don't I, want to mention that. But, but no, because people think, oh, you're just being a bit weird. But I remember, as a, young, yeah, I remember as a young person hearing, oh, they've taken religious, religion out of the curriculum and thinking, yeah. oh, my God, how will people know what's right and wrong? Because yeah. that's kind of how I learned the moral yeah. code. Yeah. I'm not saying yeah. you should follow one religion or another, yeah. but I'm saying that the moral code within the Bible and things like that yeah. actually give people a guide and it's a structure, line. especially for young people. Yeah. You don't have to be a religious person, but just yeah. have this sort of guide. Have some guidance yeah. and understand that there's a manufacturer's handbook for everything that's created and made. There's a manufacturer's handbook for you to resort to, to go and check how you're supposed to treat this product, mm. keep it safe. There's a way that how we're supposed to treat each other and keep each other safe mm. and keep each other well cared for and that's all lost. It's gone, isn't it? So you're seeing young people running around waving that's knives, crazy. swords around on the streets. Crazy. And, and, and it's shocking. People don't know the real levels of this. Mm. Some of the stuff my son will show me on his phone and what's going around Terrible. on Snapchat and TikTok and all of that. And, um, you know, imagine growing up and that's In the that. norm that's, for you. We, you know what? We, you know when they say you've dodged a bullet? In the sense you have that you're now older, you're beyond it. But as you said, you're now the parent who will then so we have ain't to be dodged the person. anything, have we? we? You haven't because you, it's the, the pain will be yours. So if we go on to parents now, mm. we haven't dodged anything. Because no. a lot of our generation need to look at how we looked at things mm. and what we wanted to change. Oh, we were beaten. Oh, we wasn't treated right. And, and we need to make sure our kids have everything make we sure. didn't have. When in fact, you could have sport your, your, you, you could have made your young person feel privileged. We, you could have softened them to the point where they have no moral guidelines and structure. You didn't make sure that they learned about God because your parents made you go church, so I'm not going to let them go. So there's so many different areas so, so, to look so, at. Talk to me briefly then about your charity because we're yeah. running out of time and I want to hear yeah, about it course. and how people can support it. If, 100%. If, how can they do that? Because well, that's the what this is all about. How can we... How can so, we so the Kind Prince Foundation, I think in people's mindsets, because we've done so great 
and, and we've been in the media with doing the Kate, um, Long Live the Prince campaign. Yeah. It hit 1.4 billion people across wow. the world. We we got the stadium renamed Kaim Prince Foundation. Mm. All these magnificent things that's happened, mm. people have thought that Kaim Prince Foundation, we made it, we've got the money, we've got everything. But our media attention and what we've achieved hasn't lined up with the financial backing that we deserve. So we've done everything. All the work that we've done has been on a shoestring budget. So if people can help or they you want know, to get 20 involved. grand little have, have funding here. Have Ten, you got a website? www.thekpf.com. Uh, we really need people to give. Why? Because there's a very special anniversary event happening on the 20th of May. What we've realised is because people think that the money's there, we need to make sure that people understand we don't have the money. So if we've been can working support, and giving our so life people can support you to this. We've got about 20 seconds. Okay, give, good. Give me the website again where people can go. If they want 20th to support, of May, we need you to buy tickets at Queen's Park Rangers box office. There's a ticket link, the box office link. Buy the tickets for this event. We've got lots of talent and stars. Harry Redknapp, wow. um, Marlon, David Harewood. We've got so many people. Can't remember all the names, but there's lots and lots. Anton Ferdinand, all, loads all of supporting, guys. All supporting this event to, to raise money people. so we can build the Future Champion Centre because we want to be able to show the model we've been using all these years that's been changing lives to actually change lives now. Let's make this happen, but we can't do it without the people. Well, the people... Well, Buy the tickets and let, donate. Let's try and help our young people stop this scourge of knife crime. Dr Mark Prince, thank you so much for joining me. It's really good to talk to you. Thank you. Of course, the founder of the Cayenne Prince Foundation.